Welcome to Democratically Speaking. My name is Mark Lindy and I'm your host and I'm the chairman of the Brockton Democratic City Committee and I do this show on my own volunteer time. Uh, today is Steve Foote, candidate for council in Ward 6. This is take two because the preliminary election is over and now we're into the general election. Welcome, Steve. Nice to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me again. Um, we Just to explain, to start off with, we were going to be doing a Ward um, 6 debate today between the two candidates, uh, Steve Foote, who's a Democrat, and Jack Lally, who's an unenrolled uh, candidate, and Jack was sick. So uh, we decided since Steve was all ready to go, we would do a show with him, and then we're hoping to reschedule the debate uh, going forward uh, if uh, when Mr. Lally is well. I hope we can do that. Um, because we've done almost all of the ward council debates um, and the school committee debates as well and a council at large debate and uh, we're just waiting for the mayoral debate. So uh, it's election time. We're about three weeks away from uh, the election, a little less than three. And uh, what are you finding out in Ward 6 when you're knocking on doors and talking to people? Well, uh, first let me just mention about the debates. I think it's a great thing to have and I'm glad BCA does it because it gives the, the folks at home a chance to see the two candidates side by side and really make a good comparison to them. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get a debate going. Uh, been doing a lot of door to door, and it, you find out a lot of interesting things when you do that. And um, I've got a, I'm keeping track. I have a whole list of things that people want to see done. Some of them I'm doing right now. Is uh, uh, some street lights have been out. I made some phone calls to get those fixed. Uh, we're doing some more road work. My street, Sully Road, is already being paved now. So we're making a little bit of progress, but I can only make so much progress as it right now I'm just a private citizen. I can only make so much progress doing that uh, until I'm elected. Hopefully I'll be elected and uh, maybe in January I can uh, make a little more happen for the folks. Now, in talking to you off camera at different events, you've been around it. There's, there's nothing but fundraisers and political events going on mm -hmm. besides the legislative uh, affairs thing that the chamber did last week. You've also reached out and talked to some of the surrounding towns. You're on the Abington Holbrook line. Ward right. 6 is that's the geogra geography of Ward 6. And you have a pretty bad problem over there with an intersection over there. And I know from what you told me, you've talked to some of the folks um, in the next town? Yes, uh, we have a real problem with uh, a, a bad intersection. There's been fatalities on the corner of Boundary Ave, North Quincy Street, and Chestnut Street in Abington. And it was a study done a while back, and it talked about all kinds of things, including a, a rotary and these real extensive things, to these big plans. And I said to myself, I looked at it, and I said, it doesn't seem to be any more of a problem than to have a traffic light there. So back in April, um, I'm also the vice chairman of the uh, Plymouth County Charter Commission, so I've come to know a lot of the people in the small towns around Brockton. And part of my area in uh, the Plymouth County Charter Commission is Abington and Rockland, as well as parts of Brockton. So I uh, met with uh, some of the people from uh, the, in Abington that I know, and it turns out that <clears throat> we've been able to come to an agreement where... Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Go ahead, clear your throat. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's always fun when you're on TV and you're trying to uh, say something and then that frog uh, kind of jumps in your throat. 250 shows the first time I had to do this. Oh, geez, okay. Well, you're prepared. You get the water because uh, you, you do the 250 shows. <coughs> well, I'm excited about the project, too. Okay, there you go. So, um, so um, we've come to an agreement with um, Abington, Brockton, and the state. The street light, the traffic light is going to go in. So it's just a matter of time now. But it's going to come, it's going to happen. Man, my efforts have paid off, and it's going to happen, and we're going to get it. So um, I, I know that during <coughs> the last debate that we did, there was some talk about connections. There was some talk about that that might, in, in some people's views, that that might be a negative thing. But in, in your view, it's a positive thing because you've already for, forged some relationships with some people from out of town. Well, I think it's positive in the sense that it's like being in business and networking. You know, once you get to know some people, then you have a lot better chance to um, get things done. And that's the way I think it works, and it paid off in this situation. Now, uh, what are you hearing from the residents when you're out there? Uh, you know, we, we talked about the traffic light, um, roads. You know, roads have been paved. There's never enough money citywide for every road and every ward to get paved. But um, 
what's your approach to that? If you, if you get elected to this seat, what are your plans? Well, you have to really take a look, good hard look at the budget and make sure that the money is being spent properly and the money is being allotted properly. And we know the mayor writes the budget, but we can um, work with them. We need to have councilors <clears throat> that can work with the mayor mm -hmm. and get things done. So that's part of it. Okay, so, um, you know, there are some major, major intersection, major roads in Ward 1. You know, Quincy Street's a, a big road. Um, Hoverton is a big road. John Drive. I, I know a little bit about the geography because one of my best friends in high school lived on Gladys Road, which is right off of Quincy Street. So I was up there in, in the village quite a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a West Side kid, but uh, hung out a lot on the east side and the north side and the south side because that's all of Brockton. Um, what do you, you, I mean, you're going door to door on the weekends, you're talking to people, whatever you can, wherever you, what, what, what's the, is there a number one concern in Ward 6? <clears throat> well, the Cary Hill Fire Station is a big deal. And we have to have that open because we have about 81% residential housing in Ward 6. And not just for the fire protection alone, but for the EMT services that it provides. And now that we have Brewster Ambulance, who is doing a fine job uh, in conjunction with our fire department, but our fire department can get this just within seconds. And that comfort level that it provides the uh, residents when the, fire, uh, the firefighters show up, and even if you're still waiting for the ambulance, you just have that comfort level that you feel like you're going to be all right, and that means the world to, to somebody. And, and that can also be the difference between life and death, because if, you, if, if you're older and you're having problems and, you know, it might not be the first time you called and you get nervous and, you know, it affects your health. So it, that's very important. That's one of the main things we're going to fight, make sure that stays open and stays fully manned. Are you hearing people talk about the taxes, their water rates, their sewer rates, uh, you know, what's affordable and what's not affordable? I, I, I think uh, if, if you look at the, the, the ward list with it being very residential and there are a lot of people that have been in their homes in Ward 6 for a long period of time. It's, mm -hmm. not, a, it's not a transient ward. There's not a lot of going and coming because I think a lot of people, you get some of the original homeowners. I mean, your family has owned a home there forever, right? Yeah, we have second, we have a lot of second and third generation families still at Ward 6, and um, taxes are a big thing, and you to, or to, in order to stay in your house, we need to get the taxes, keep the taxes where they are. The only way to do that is to increase revenue, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're going to try to bring some business into the village. Um, I'm working on some things in, in that vein, but nothing is near enough to fruition to really make any kind of announcement so but I am working on some of that behind the scenes. You can't really make a commitment I think you said earlier in the show until you're actually in the seat you, you, because you have to work with the economic development team at City Hall uh, the, 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 I would think the Chamber of Commerce, the, um, I noticed you mentioned in the debate and when I interviewed you the last time you know there's a lot of focus, Camp Pello, a lot of focus downtown, a lot of focus in Montello, but the village, Ward 6 section of the city doesn't fall into any of those categories. So I, I'm assuming you want to help redevelop and revitalize your area. Again, what was the percentage of residential you said? About 81%. So 81%. So there's not a lot of room, there's not, there's not a lot of free land anymore in Brockton that isn't conservation land or environmentally protected land to do stuff. Um, I mean, I, gr I grew up in the city and I saw the village when I was a kid. There, there were thriving businesses there. There were bakeries there, some of the best bakeries in the city. Those are gone. The, even the number of bars, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a regular bar patron, but they're way less than they were back in the day. And because it was a factory area, you, you, you had you know, right, it was right there. I mean, people didn't all have cars. They didn't drive. I mean, we do, we have transportation and, and we do have the MBTA right there, but what do you envision for like that area? Well, we have to make use of the T station. That's, that's, that's something that wasn't there back in the day. So now that it's there and it's been, it's been all redone and it's, it's a nice T station, but people use it as a, um, place to park their car when they're going someplace else. We want them to be able to have something down in the village that makes them, you know, maybe some type of, you know, if we get 
business down there and we can get the place revitalized, we can have these kind of coffee shops and types of things where somebody might come before they go on the train to go to work or after work. If we had some of those bars that were there, and you know, not the ones from the old days, but uh, you know, some newer, better, better police type things, then people might stick around after they get off the train. That's the key. And um, there is land available. It's, I don't think it would be take all that much to get that revitalized, but it's got to be part of the comprehensive uh, project that they're doing in the downtown now, and which is stretching into Campello. And, uh, but it doesn't really get up into Montello. It certainly doesn't get into the village. And I want to talk with the downtown manager and with the, um, uh, the uh, I can't think of it. I've already made deliver. I've already reached out to the chamber. And uh, so we've got things working. The initial contacts have been made. But again, as you stated earlier, if I'm not elected, it, it, that only goes so far because I'm still a private citizen and they're going to, you know, they're, they're obviously going to want to talk to, you know, who's elected. So that's, that's why it's critically important. This election is very important. We need experience. We need somebody who already knows how to work his way around City Hall. Now, um differentiate yourself now you're down to a two-person race okay you, you there was a three-person race there were a lot of similarities between you and John Drusinskis in terms of how long you've lived in the ward I mean I think you played on rival hockey teams if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. okay you're no offense you're the old kid on the block <laughs> yeah you're running against the new kid on the block young man uh, college student what's the contrast well, the big difference is experience, obviously. I mean, uh, I've lived in the ward for 56 years. He's lived there for 14 or 15, I believe. And um, you just, there's certain things you learn in life just by being around, observing, having lived through it, going to school there. He went, I, I went to Brockton High School. He went to private school. It's just, there's different contrasts there. Uh, he's a fine guy, but he doesn't have the experience necessary. The, we, we're going to have, after this election's over, we're going to have at least three new councillors. That's a given. Maybe as many as six new councillors, depending on how the vote goes. When you have three out of 11 new councillors on, you can't have three of them in a learning curve at the same time. I'm not going to need a learning curve. I've watched every city council meeting since the year 2000, every single one of them, thanks to Proctor Community Access, for the ones that I'm not at. So uh, I already know what to do. And I've been on different boards and different committees. I've been the chairman of the Democratic City Committee for six years. And uh, as I stated with the Plymouth County Charter Commission, I've been involved in many meetings under Robert's Rules of Order. I know how, to, how that works. I know how to do it. I would be an effective city councilor from the very first moment I sat in that, took the oath of office and sat in that chair. Uh, that's the biggest difference between me and my opponent, the, the level of experience. He's a fine guy. and. He'll maybe twist his way up through the ranks. When I was in college, I was a student senator at Massasoit. That's how I started to get involved. Then I got on a couple of boards, worked my way up through the Democratic City Committee, and then you, you learn as you go along. But it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to live the time, do the time, and live through it. And I think the experience factor is the biggest thing. And with our bond rating, it has just been reduced. We have a lot of big issues that are going to affect the bond rating coming up. It's just no time for inexperience. We have to have somebody in there that is well-versed in all these issues, that already knows a lot about these things, and can be effective from day one, and I think I can do that. Walk us through the budget process. Having been a regular watcher, thank you for watching. It's nice to know people are looking at the channel. You usually, if something's wrong with it, we usually find out something versus if some. As a matter of fact, when we've had some technical problems, you've called me yeah. to tell me. We, we had a, a bad fiber over at the, the Baker School and we were able to resolve that. But the budget process is the mayor submits a budget and the council cuts the budget, but the council scrutinizes the budget from your experience watching but also dealing with budgets how would that help your 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 constituents in Ward 6? Well the council can only cut the budget you can't move money which is a big thing that people think you can do they think you can take some from from the library let's say and move it into the fire department you cannot do that all you can do is lower a budget but the key to working with a budget and the key to getting um, a budget correct in the way to uh, 
work is to work in conjunction with the mayor's office before he even gives you the budget. Uh, just talk to him. Let them know what your concerns are. Let them know that, hey, my, my people up in Ward 6 uh, want some more money for village revitalization or whatever the case may be. Now, he's not obligated to do anything with that information, but the fact that you bring it forward, you put the bug in his ear, it helps. And in the fact that he knows that you're probably going to be looking at that particular item is vital, I think. It's, it's crucial. And that, that's, that's where we have to get a, a much better uh, working relationship between the current council and, and the new council come January and the mayor's office. We, we have no, there's, there's certain councils that just dislike the mayor for what, this current mayor for whatever reasons. They will not work with him. And that is why we have all these major obstacles and stumbling blocks on things that really should be able to be worked out. Do you think you can work with whoever the mayor is, whether it be the current mayor or if there's a new mayor? Yes, I think I can. I've known them both for quite a while, and I know them both fairly well. So I think that I'll be able to uh, work well with them. Uh, that's not to say that I will never disagree with one of them, either one of them. But uh, I think as long as you can, if you have a disagreement and if you, if you have an opposing point of view, as long as you can back that up with reasonable uh, reasons why you think that the way you think instead of just saying well that's how I feel nobody nobody's gonna do anything with that if you say look I, I, I don't I don't like this issue because of this 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 and that then it makes them start thinking maybe they see it your way after a while you know or, or maybe the other way it happens maybe they say well we yeah that's a good idea Steve but we can't do that because of this and I go oh geez I wasn't aware of that that could happen too so it's communication. It's about communication. It's about being able to, and that only comes with experience. You have to have experience. You have to be, have experience working with people. I've been in sales. My dad was a salesman. And he took, used to take me on sales calls when I was 10 years old. I had a little suit. I'd go with him on sales calls. So I've been brought up this way. I know how this works. And does that mean I get everything I want? Nope. But does that but does it mean I can get somebody's ear and at least get them to listen to me? Most of the time. Communication. Let's talk communication. What would you do to communicate as a city councilor? You're, you're on TV every Monday night for either council or FinCom and an occasional Tuesday night when there's a holiday. Would you have regular ward meetings? How would you communicate with your constituents? Well, we'll, get, we'll do the ward meetings, but I've found that the ward meetings that I've been to are sparsely attended. It's too bad, you know, people have plenty to say, but then you have a ward meeting and not that many of them show up, or you get half of them show up and they're not even in your ward, they just want to beef about some big issue that they think is on the table. I want to do it more like uh, you see your state reps do it. You know, I want to hold office hours. I want to say, okay, I'm going to be at uh, whatever location between 10 and 12. You come in, just come in and off the street and see me. And I'll do it at night, too, So, because I know people work. You know, that's the problem with office hours with the state representatives and stuff is because they always have them during the day. You want to have them like it's, you know, something like 6 to, ni six to 8 at night or 6 to 9 at night so people at work can come in and see you. Or, of course, I, I, could, I would be more than willing to make an appointment with anybody that wants to see me and go either go see them or they can come see me. But uh, we will do ward meetings as well. And I'm planning on attending the ward meetings of other councillors, just, you know, not to get in there and say too much, but to, just to observe and see what's on the minds of people in other wards, even though, you know, my primary concern is Ward 6, but it doesn't, it certainly doesn't hurt to know what the general feel is. Well, you bound Ward 5 and Ward 7 right next to each other in mm -hmm. that part of the city. Um, now, you're kind of old-fashioned like me. You have a landline at home. So you'll be able to put your number up there, have people get in touch with you. You have a cell phone too. I'm not a, saying you're yeah. I'm not saying you're an old Well, I have the cell phone. Anything, you can get me on the cell phone, but it, which is uh 508-479-8373. But I also have the landline which is 508-587-3126. And a lot of times people just want to tell you, "Hey, my street lights out." They don't really want to get into it with you for an hour. They just want to tell you my street lights out at the corner of this street and that street. And as far as the lights, folks, if I'm elected, don't worry about reading the numbers on the polls or all of that stuff that they tell you to do. Call me. Let me know where the light is. I'll get down. I'll read the number off the poll. I'll take care of it. 
Now, big issues of the day there. We've talked about them in the debate. We've talked about them in the other show that we did. However, I know you for a while. You weren't a big fan of all these big fancy contracts and, and schemes or whatever you will with, with the desal plant, with the power plant, with Campanelli Stadium. Do you feel that you're equipped to go through those contracts, either reset some things back to where they should be, in your opinion, or um, enhance them? I mean, there's, there's issues that seem to like drag on and drag on. You know, you hear the same issues every single time at, at, at election time. You see, they, they just keep coming up. I've been doing this cl for close to 22 years in terms of election coverage. What could be done differently? Um, and like you said, there could be a lot of changes. Either three new counselors or well, any number. There's definitely going to be three. There's three or there's a number going forward. Do you think that's going to change the council? Uh, I hope it does. I hope it does. And I hope some, because some of these counselors are too locked into their thoughts about certain things. Um, as far as the power plant goes, I've been saying since I, I host, I moderated the very first power plant debate back in 2007 uh, here in this studio. And um, so I know all about the power plant, but it's not a question of whether I know about the power plant. Very rarely does this happen, but this is one time it is happening. I am not a big fan of ballot questions, but in this case with something that's been so divisive that nobody seems to be able to get a handle on as far as for or against as both sides make a strong argument, both sides say they everybody's against it, everybody's for it, but they don't want to come out because the, the other side will yell at them and blah, blah, blah. This has been going on for now eight years. This is ridiculous. I've been saying for the past seven years to put this question on the ballot. I will file a resolve if I'm elected to put this on the ballot and let the people vote on it and let the people decide the same way they voted on the casino. We're going to let them vote. On, I'll let them vote on the power plant. Now, does that mean it's going to happen? I have to get other counselors to go along with me to get it on the ballot. Some of them don't want it on the ballot. And I don't think either side in the argument wants it really on the ballot because I'm not sure, because neither side's sure they're going to win it. But I say, let's get it on the ballot. Let's get a definite vote of the people. And then that way, if we are getting sued, or we being the city, getting sued, at least we can go to court and say, Your Honor, I'm a representative of the people. Here's the day they voted. This is what they voted. This is why I have the position I have. I'm back in what my constituents want me to do. At least then you have a chance at the fight instead of just give, pouring money into it. And when the judge says, well, what's your side? You go, well, I just don't like it. The desal plant, like I said, I did a bunch of debates with different candidates for different ward counselors, obviously not ward six. And someone suggested I put the, they put the desal question on the ballot. To me, my own personal opinion, I think that's a question that a counselor should decide. You're, you're, you're sitting there, there's a contract in place, whether the contract has been breached or not is, is another story. That's probably going to be litigated at some point because they're going to want their money. But there's a proposal the mayor has on the table to buy the desal plant for $88 million. And that is at least the current number that I'm aware of. What's your thought on that? If you do the math on the 88 million, he wants to, I believe he wants to bond it out over 20 years. If that's true, then that's going to cost us 4.4 million a year. But right now, we're paying them 6.1 million a year to purchase the water that we really don't need. So theoretically, this is without looking at the contract, this is just from going by what I've heard. Theoretically, we could save close to 2 million a year by buying the plant because we would we would no longer have to pay them the 6.1, but we still would pay the 4.4, but we would have the asset in the plant, at which point then we, not Aquaria, we, the city of Brockton, could go out and sell the water to other communities. I understand what the mayor is trying to do with that. Now, whether the price is right, I do not know, and I would have to, tell, I would have to actually see the, the formal proposal, which you know, I'm not going to see until, unless I'm elected and, and get into office in January. So that's... That's why he wants to do that. I understand why he wants to do that. Now, some, now I've heard, as a matter of fact, on your counselor at large debate that I was watching the other night, some of the counselors were saying, well, Aquarius is disrespectful to us, to this, that, and the other thing. 
The reason Aquaria, Aquaria is actually doing them a favor because Aquaria has a buyer for the water. It's the, it's the proposed power plant. But the council will not sell the power plant the water. I mean, so that way, so Aquaria is actually trying to not say that in as many words, but that's, if it comes down to a lawsuit, if we try to not pay Aquaria, I believe that they will come to court and say, we have a buyer. The, the city of Brockton's the one that's blocking our buyer from purchasing our water and we'll lose the lawsuit. That's what I think would happen. Unfortunately, I, you know, some councils will disagree with me, but that's what I think would happen. What about Stonehill and the sewer rates? There, there's been an issue there for years. There was different agreements signed for a certain length of time in terms of whether they've, they, I mean, they, they've lived up to the agreement that was signed for a lower rate. But you don't get an opportunity necessarily to have a lower rate as a homeowner. What's your thoughts on that? That's the easiest one of all. They pay the same as everybody else pays. Whatever a business of that size would pay, they should be paying. And that's it. And that's my position on it. That's what, that will be my position on it. Anything we haven't covered or anything you want to get out, you're going to, we're, we're close to the end. I think we've got about three minutes left. So I want to make sure you have time for a closing statement. But anything that we didn't get to, that's part of your platform. Well, just to the fact that, that uh, the road repair thing it has been, uh, there was a time a few years back, there was a million dollars um, appropriated by the city council to, to buy some kind of a computer program that was going to uh, rate the roads from worst to best, and then they were going to start paving them that way. And uh, over a seven-year span, I think it was going to be, all the roads were going to be done, and then they would start in again. So theoretically, your road would be, repa your road would be repaved every seven years. Okay? I'm going to find out what happened with that. And if that money was not spent for that, I want to put back in the general funds. So that's, my, that's, that's the biggest thing. As far as road repair is concerned, I don't see why it should have to be such a, such a big bugaboo runaround. I think it can be done a lot easier, and I'm gonna, that's one of the things I'm really going to work hard because the roads in Ward 6 are terrible. Some of them are no more than dirt roads with a little bit of cold patch on them. Two minutes, you get the bulk of it, minute, minute 30. Tell the voters whatever you want to tell them, your phone number, your website, and why they should elect Steve Foote. Okay, well, the biggest thing is, like I said earlier, our, budget, our um, bond rating is in critical shape right now. We're at a crossroads here. We need experienced leadership that can, knows how to do things right out of the gate. We don't have time to have a two-year learning curve for a, brand, for a brand new guy that has no experience at all. I bring that experience. I already know who to talk to. I already know what to do. I've been studying this position for a long time. I've been working on it now, virtually doing the job for the last six months, even though I haven't been elected yet. I ask you for your vote because now is the time, the critical time, the, the decisions we make now will affect Brockton for the next 15 or 20 years. We don't want to leave our children with a big burden behind us, uh, especially in my ward, Ward 6, where our children are probably going to take our houses and live in them as well as we did and our parents before us and even our grandparents in some cases. I think it's critical. I ask for your vote on Tuesday, November the 3rd. My name is Steve Foote. Remember, I work for you. I'm already doing the job working for you, and I'll continue to do so if I'm elected on November the 3rd and take office in January. And thank you very much for your time and consideration. Well, Steve, thanks for being on Democratically Speaking. We still hope find a way to do a debate before uh, November 3rd so you can compare and contrast. And in the meantime, uh, you know, hopefully the weather stays warm when you're on the campaign trail. So far, trail. it's been pretty good. I can't complain about the weather on the campaign trail so far. Perfect. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Um, you're watching Democratically Speaking. Mark Lindy, your host. Stay tuned for more candidates who are members of the Democratic Party. This is a nonpartisan election, but there are candidates from different parties that have aligned themselves over the years. You, you're watching Democratically Speaking. Thank you for joining us.